you're not always in control of how people treat your restaurant. You know, you'll build something, you'll think it's going to be like this, and people will come in and treat it completely different, and you have to react to that. But so many people have walked in the door and said, oh my God, I, I could be in New York, I could be in London, I could be, it does, this doesn't feel New Zealand, you know, this feels, this feels quite international. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Growing up on a farm delivers a unique connection with the land and what it produces. For many, carving careers as chefs, the greater the connection to those that farm, grow, catch and harvest the produce they use, the greater ability they have to let it shine on the plate. But what impact does growing up on a farm give those that are lured to a life in hospitality? Josh Emmett is an award-winning chef and restaurateur and owner of the Oyster Inn and Onslow in New Zealand. Josh, how are you? Great, thank you. You uh, grew up on a farm. What, take us back to that time as a kid. What was it like? Oh, uh, uh, idyllic, I think is the first way to explain it. Um, perfect. You know, we, we had a, we didn't have a large farm. I mean, it was probably 300 acres, um, which is a reasonable size. We had, uh, you know, um, uh, originally it was a dairy farm when I was very young and then we moved to one down the road um, uh, and we had bulls, we had sweet corn, we had sheep, we, you know, chickens, dogs, um, cats, you know. Um, we had actually one boundary of the farm um, was a river, which was uh, the, the Waipa River, which was amazing actually because that sort of, that, that was, that we spent a lot of time down there. What sort of role did food play in your family when you were young? A really big role for me, I think. Um, you know, we were, I've got an older brother and a younger sister and, you know, we were hungry. We were farm kids. We ate, especially me and my brother, we ate the whole time. Um, my first, I cooked from a very young age, um, mostly because of my sweet tooth, to be honest, uh, and um we you know we never really bought pantry bought items you know mum wouldn't go to the supermarket and buy um biscuits and 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 that sort of thing even though we would sort of craze them as kids uh and we only generally went to the supermarket once a week um but uh we had chooks so we had eggs we had flour we had you know um butter and milk and all the other ingredients to make any any cake you would ever want to so um i said about just sort of making um you know making and baking all sorts of things from a very young age because once you made it you owned it and you, you ate it you know your interest started quite early but take us back to when you first started working in a commercial kitchen do you remember your first day uh, depends on the commercial kitchen, really. I mean, I worked in various places from a really young age, actually. I mean, first thing was washing dishes. I washed dishes from the age of 15 at um, at a uh, rest home in, in Hamilton called Wilson Carlisle. Um, and it was a, my brother worked there as well. It was a superb job, actually. It, most of my mates were doing paper runs for pittance, you know, and, and we were getting, I think, you know, um, $7, $10, $12 an hour. Um, um, for uh, serving, um, it was mostly old ladies. There was there was sixty residents, and and we were um, and there was a few men in the main house, but most of the villas, which had ten in each, um, had old ladies in them. And we would take a trolley down there at tea time, serve them tea, wash up, come back, and that and that was it. That was my and the cooks and and that uh, with, were two ladies, um, you know, a middle aged woman who cooked really well. Um, and were pretty hard on us, to be honest, because we were we were clowns at that stage, weren't we? So, um, but it was a brilliant job. That was my that was my first introduction in Hamilton. Yeah, I know that you've cooked all over the world, and um, we're going to talk about that shortly. But what were the real important moments early on in your career in New Zealand? Uh, I think, you know, a really grounding uh, thing for me was when I left school. Really, I mean, I. I, I, I my parents went away for four weeks on holiday and, and, um, to Japan, I think. Um, and they left it, my brother and I at home, I was probably 17. He might've been 19 and I, I just didn't go to school for four weeks. So when they came back, they sort of said, well, that's it. I went and, and sort of kicked me out and I went and went asparagus picking for four weeks and applied for culinary school, uh, and, and got accepted, thankfully, probably for, by a bit of a leg up from someone we knew in the, um, actual school. Cause my marks from high school were terrible. You know, I, I'm not, 
not I'm not I'm not I'm not stupid, but I um you know I, I wasn't exactly applying myself. Um so you know and I came out of that and uh, out of culinary school, I, I went to Auckland and worked in a place called Chinchins, which was which was amazing in Auckland back then. Um, I had as part of your culinary education, you know, you had to find yourself a work placement. So I, I worked there seven weeks for free, um, and I, you know, I'd worked hard and saved a lot of money, um, but that literally just you know blew the bank account. Um, and thankfully, at the end of it, they gave me a job, um, and away I went. I worked there sort of for the next um, eighteen months, uh, and then you know I wanted to get out of New Zealand. Um, as quick as possible my brother had already moved to um the uk um so like many kiwis at that at that time you know you got a two-year working visa and and away you went and i i got out of there as quick as i could you spent uh, a decade um with the gordon ramsay group um tell us about how you started there and and what it was like working in that group well, it was an interesting path to get there. I mean, the, the first the first part of it probably is that I went up to the UK for that first two years, and I spent a year with I spent a year in a restaurant, an Irish restaurant in Mayfair, and then I spent um, about ten months with um, Stephen Terry um, at a restaurant called Coast, which um, at that point um, Jason Atherton was one of the sous chefs there. Mark Sargent was um, was my was my mate, and he was working there. Um, a whole lot of other guys as well, uh, and I worked there for ten months and then my visa ran out and stupidly I didn't I hadn't renewed or done anything about it so uh, at that point I sort of hightailed it I didn't want to come home um, and had foolishly put myself in that position so I came down to Melbourne to Australia uh, and started working for Donovan Cook um, at SDSDS Donovan and Philippa uh, and I, I stayed there for um, I mean it's it's easy to explain. I worked six days a week for three years, and that's all I bloody did. Um, and there was just nothing else. Uh, and it was, you know, it was. I suppose that was quite career defining because I was, you know, I was, I was just. Fo- that's all I was focused on. I didn't enjoy it. To be honest, I didn't enjoy Melbourne much because it was, you know, I just worked. But um, and then I turned around at the end of that three year stint, uh, and you know, went to the south of France, worked on super yachts for. For, I think three months to put a put a whole lot of money in my bank account, um, and I was sort of 26 at that point, and pretty fired up and pretty hungry for 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 work. And and Donovan knew, you know, Stephen Terry had known Gordon. Um, Donovan knew Gordon because they'd all worked in the same kitchen with Marco. Um, and you know, I, I went back to London and uh, and got a job for Gordon um, with Gordon. Uh, he um, sponsored me at that point. Um, he, you know, he only really had the one or sort of two restaurants, I suppose, at that point. Uh, but you know, got my visa through him, and and that, and then uh, you know, eleven years later, um, I spent a, spent a long time with him. Tell us what it was like working with Gordon then, when he only had a few restaurants. Is gone on to all sorts of things with television and everything now what was it like in those early days yeah it was it was probably everything you would ever read about that and we know we know you know anyone in the industry knows what it who's been through europe or london or on those days i think it was it was it was heinous you know it was brutal um and you know, uh, pretty unforgiving and a really, uh, a really baptism of fire um, in any of those tough, ki- tough kitchens. But I think it was, you know, a lot of chefs back then saw it like a bit of a rite of passage. Really, uh, you know, if the, if it wasn't hard, it wasn't right. You know, you weren't if it wasn't hard, you weren't in the right kitchen. Um, and people sort of, you know, searched that out a little bit. I, you know, when I turned up in, in, in that kitchen, I. You know, I, I, I felt like I found what I'd been looking for. You know, it was it was hideous hours. It was, you know, really hard work. It was very focused on the food, um, attention to detail, all that sort of thing. Um, you know, it was a really great learning environment if you could take the good and forget the bad. Um, you know, and and apply yourself in the good areas. And I was pretty pretty. Um, Straight down the line, I wanted to just get in there and work hard. So, look, I, 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 those first couple of years, um, I absolutely loved it. And I was there sort of just over a year actually, and then went with uh, Mark Sargent and opened Gordon Ramsay at Claridge's, uh, spent about 18 months there, and then went and opened the Savoy Grill as head chef. 
Uh, I spent, you know, I spent three years there, um, which was, you know, so I, I, I loved that. Um, you know, I was in a hotel and which I, I never really wanted to work in a hotel. It's quite interesting the path you, you follow as a chef because, uh, you know, I think any young chef has this, has this, um, idea that they want their own restaurant i would say if they're ambitious and they have a picture in their mind from a very early age of what that looks like and um the reality is not always you know some people don't find that that restaurant their whole lives that site that specific idea you know i think you you have to it's it's a long old windy road you know and you have to um take your opportunities as they come and that sort of thing and, you know, Savoy Grill, I love the historical aspect of it. I, I loved everything about it, to be honest. Um, and as Gordon always sort of said, he'll, he'll um, you know, he'll put you up there on, on a platform on which to perform and, and put everything around you and then let you go at it um, if he trusts you. And, and, that's, and that's sort of the opportunities that I got. And I took them with, um, with gusto. The Savoy Grill is renowned. Do you do you have any stories of that time that you can um, share with us? Uh, I I I I did it hard. You know, it was, I was I was twenty eight years old and it was my first head chef role. Um, and, you know, standing in there by myself, I had Marcus Waring as you know Marcus Waring's name was on the door, but um, he was at Petrus most of the time, and it was it was mine to run and. And, you know, we had a big team. Um, there was all, you know, there's all sorts of shenanigans went on in there. Um, we had an incredible um, uh, guest list following, you know, we, um, the maitre d' that was there left over from who had been there many, many years, probably 20 or 30 years, actually. Uh, and I can't even remember his name. Angelo Maresco, I think, was his name. Gorgeous, gorgeous old Italian guy. Um, but they had, they had, you know, table plans from the... Um, you know, from the 40s, the 20s, 30s, 40s, where, you know, John Wayne sat on table four and the Jackie and the Kennedy sat on table 24 and these people sat there and and on and on and on it went. So, and, and you know, um, Parliament used to call it the canteen. Um, so, they, you know, uh, people like that, um, a lady called Fiona Shackleton, who's one of the most, you know, sort of powerful lawyers and, um, you know, um, in London, I, she always sat on table 24. I'll never forget that. I don't know why. It sticks in my head always. She was one of our best regulars. You know, just just that historical thing that, you know, and it had been there 110 years and, and we got a Michelin star um, there, which it had never had. Uh, and But I think the important thing was, and this, this is the thing I learned learned early on about about restaurants, I suppose, is that, you know they they have to they have to make sense and the most important thing for me as a young kiwi chef 28 years old you know going into somewhere like the savoy grill was whether i had ambitions to go into molecular or cook spanish food or um french food or a certain style um you you had to go in there and and dig deep into what the savoy Gr grill was respect that history and take it forward and 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 make it make sense with the decor, the room, the style of service, everything like that. It had to be had to be classic. And if I had gone on you know, in my own direction, um, it wouldn't have worked. You ended up working in New York, LA, Melbourne for the Ramsey Group. What was the real highlights for you? Well, New York was incredible because we went out there to uh, you know, to essentially take Royal Hospital Road, um, Gordon's flagship to New York and you know the um, uh, we had a great site and a, and a great building. Um, it was diff again. It was difficult. It was a, it was a five hundred and five hundred and sixty suite hotel. Um, beautiful hotel. Great rooms. Uh, and you know we were doing the whole thing. I was doing the uh, the whole thing. Two restaurants. Um, you know we got two Michelin stars in the first year out there, um, which was which was amazing. Um, you know that was that's definitely a highlight for me. Um, it was extremely tough conditions. Uh, we we it was a fully unionised hotel. Um, I had never dealt with the unions before. Um, we were sort of 
from the questions we asked early on, we were told that that was going to be taken care of. You don't take care. You don't take care of the unions; they take care of you. Um, you know, we. Um, I had so many blow ups and arguments, and and some really interesting characters. I've been threatened, and you know, it's, there's nights where I thought I'd walk out the back door, and someone would take me with a baseball bat. You know, um, we had we had nights where we had union reps um, on a Friday night. You know, it, and it's interesting because they, the union reps would, you know, there might be a dis- small dispute over something really, 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 really um, trivial. But they would, they literally walked in through the through the restaurant into the kitchen on a Friday night and started emptying the um, first aid kits into the bin, um, tipping oil down the sinks, uh, tipping over our rubbish bins, not in a, too much of a malicious way, but just disruptive and that you know there might be uh, five or ten of them and i'd be literally like what what are you fucking guys doing here just you know go home what what, what do you want you know and we would have these sorts of arguments and then they would sort of meander off and leave me alone again um it was it was it was strange and we but we i struggled with that a lot um but you know on the on the flip side of that we had you know an incredible kitchen and and you know, we were we were very busy and and really successful, um, but it was just certainly put a strain on things. But um, yeah, I loved it. New York, New York's New York. You know, we 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 got this. We got to the first lunch on um, literally in the first week, um, and you know, I'd come from the Savoy Grill on a Monday lunch. We'd sell, you know, we'd do a hundred covers and. There would be you'd sell sixty bottles of red wine. They would just they just drank like it was it was ridiculous. Um, you know, Monday lunch in New York. There was you know we did um, forty covers and there was twenty iced teas and we didn't even know how to make an iced tea. We didn't we you know cut to a week later and we've you know there's an ice ice tea machine in the kitchen making ice teas for us but you know that that was the classic that that sums it up you know you can't take the same idea same concept same everything and, and drop it into new york um and it's you know you say tomato i say tomato it's it's it, they it's, they don't treat things the same way and we had to we had to figure that out really quickly um and adjust you were part of the team that uh, launched Maze in Melbourne, which wasn't around very long. What, what was it like to be involved in that with such a short sort of lifespan as well in that restaurant? Oh, it was it was tough, you know, and that was, you know, I was probably 10 years deep uh, with Gordon at that point. Um, I came to Australia to, I didn't really want to leave New York, but New York was hard and I wanted to sort of sort of move and do something else. And, and um, Australia was a move for me to sort of get to Australia for a year um, and, and then um, come back and probably head back to the UK. I was um, sort of... Um, had an English um, girlfriend slash wife um, that I had just had a um, baby in New York with, um, Helen, who's who's my wife. And, um, you know, we, we spent a year in Australia. It was tough. Again, it was, you know, it was rolling out that um, maze concept. And, you know, we were really busy for that year. Um, and I left after a year and, and that was that was the end of me and my time with Gordon Ramsay. And, and, and the blessing about that, that whole thing. And, I, you know, to be honest, I, you know, whenever I, I, I knew I was going to leave that organisation um, someday and that it probably wasn't going to be pretty. Uh, and, you know, the focus always was. The, moment, the day I walked in there, I knew that the most important thing was to take the good and leave the bad and come out of it probably as unscarred as possible, you know, out of, out of, you know, your, your, your twenties life in kitchens and come out of it with a pretty solid head on your shoulders and, and, um, you know, still loving the industry and all that sort of thing. So take the good, get rid of the bad. Uh, and, you know, and, and hopefully you've built yourself a platform to move on to bigger and better things. Um, but my dad, but my dad was, um, unfortunately, it got cancer while we were in Australia. So we left Australia. We came back to New Zealand, uh, and I spent my last two months with my father, which I otherwise would have never been able to do. Um, we had another baby. We got married. He passed away. We moved house about bloody 
four times. Uh, it was it was a pretty hideous time, you know. Uh, and then eventually um, we moved back to the UK, and you know I really didn't work for eighteen months in the UK. This episode is proudly supported by Open Table. Nearly one third of diners are booking same day. So they're making those decisions on the spot. And 10% are are making their bookings within just a few hours. And so it's why it's so important to have booking software like OpenTable, which allows your diners to discover you. And so when restaurants are on platforms like OpenTable, they're much more likely to be discovered. We help diners to connect to restaurants. Ultimately, having technology, using technology, helps you to reattach to those diners. Experience the power of Open Table. For an exclusive offer, visit restaurant.opentable.com.au forward slash DITW. You eventually um, came back to New Zealand and the impact that you've had there has been extraordinary. Um, you've uh, played a role on MasterChef for many years. You've had many successful award-winning restaurants. What was it like, though, cementing yourself in the the New Zealand restaurant industry that you hadn't really been part of for a long time? Yeah, it was great. I wouldn't say it was it was seamless. You know, we've we've had a we've had a great run back in 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 New Zealand. Uh, that period of living in the UK, we um, I I spent half my time in New Zealand. Uh, we were sort of living between New Zealand and the UK, and I I had started doing MasterChef New Zealand, which I started just before I left Gordon actually. Uh, and you know that was a massive hit in New Zealand. You know, I did uh, I think five or six seasons of that. Uh, we we when I, when I opened Rata in Queenstown, we were still living uh, in the UK. You know, I moved down to New Zealand for six weeks, opened it, then went back to the UK and came back three weeks later and went. You know, and back and forth I went. And Rata, you know, is 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 a beautiful restaurant in Queenstown. It's it's 10 years old in, in May um, of next year. Uh, and, you know, it's it's just gone from strength to strength. It's an amazing business. It's been rock solid for um, 10 years, which is really what I set out to create is, you know, I'm pretty commercial about things you, 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 you know you want to open a restaurant that wants that wants to stand the test of time and last right at last right you know you know you, you mentioned you know may's only been there a year and you know new york wasn't easy either and um you do want these things to last uh we opened rata and then my business partner and i also opened madame Wu uh in queenstown and then went on to move uh open a couple more of those around new zealand um and then and then another offshoot of that so um you know it was it was uh, we eventually it was we we had moved back fully into New Zealand by this point and um you know we lived in Auckland and and which we've been for the last 10 years and uh it's been it's been great i mean i i, I sort of i approached it quite differently you know I, I i when i came back to New Zealand i didn't want to just replicate what I'd done overseas I wanted to come and dig a bit deeper and and again you know not start from scratch but just go and do something that wasn't what I'd been doing for so many years and that's really what Rata was about even though you took technique and ideas and repertoire and all the things that you had learned for so many years it was about applying it to you know the region to to Otago to you know and that's sort of part of referencing back to what we did with the Savoy right you take your environment and you mm you think it through and that's what you work with. How much did your cooking change when you uh, moved back to New Zealand and started with that approach? Uh, quite a lot, I think. It's still te- technically the same, uh, but we try and just use, you know, the thing about New Zealand is very seasonal, right? Uh, in, 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 the, in the UK or in, in, in America, I mean, you can get, America you can get anything anywhere, anytime, at any cost. It's just, it's not an issue. And that's, and that's fine, but it's not. It's not. Uh, you know, as you get, oh, uh, it's not. Te- it's not technically right to me. You know, it. Uh, you, if you, you, I suppose, if you think globally and you know, food miles and all that sort of thing. Of course, you you know, you can you can think globally and just get what you want from where you want and when you want it. But uh, in you know, in Queenstown, you you cook from you know the radius around Queenstown. You don't. We 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 
stopped using products from overseas and stopped using products, imported products and that sort of thing, really focus on cooking as seasonally as possible, which, you know, creates boundaries for you to work within. Um, and making sure that my, my, my cooking's really simplistic and really um, ingredient focused as well. So it doesn't, um, you know, um, go sideways. In February 2020, you took ownership of the Oyster Inn and a month later, a pandemic landed. What's it been like having a restaurant um, during this time that you only just opened before it happened? Oh, well, you know, um, it was, uh, it's been interesting. Uh the oyster ends a blessing, you know. That's that's again. I think I, I, I like to see look on the positive side, as you've, as you've probably said. You know, but honestly, the oyster and we we it, it actually came to us in late two thousand and nineteen, and we sort of went, oh no no no, we, we, we're we're focused on opening Onslow. That's it's too quick, it's too soon, and then. Um, it, it sort of dropped back in our laps around Christmas or New Year um, that the couple of deals had gone on, it had fallen through, and we immediately rang the old owners who actually built um, the Oyster and a couple of guys called Jonathan and Andrew, who are really good friends of ours, uh, and done an amazing job with the brand. And we'd, we'd been going there for years. It's been there for two, since 2012, and we loved the place. And we said, what are we going to do? And they're like, buy it. And, and away we went, you know. Uh, so we bought it, took over, um, and they they came back and sort of consulted with us to get it back to its former glory because it had had sort of an in between owner. Um, and you know, four weeks it was massively busy for those four weeks from the moment we took over. Uh, and you know, we were trying to figure out, okay, so how are we going to how are we going to refurb? How are we going to clean the place? How we how are we going to paint maintenance? You know, just tidy the whole ship up and get it get it back on track. And and in some ways, you know, lockdown allowed us to do that. At the end of it, we 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 got stuck in Auckland for level four um, and then we moved, moved, we moved to the island at level three um, and we had to get, you know, prepare the business for opening again. So um, we lived in there with a the dog and it's got three beautiful little boutique rooms. So um, Helen and myself and the two kids and our au pair and the dog moved in and, uh, you know, stayed there for about four or five weeks and, and got it in a really good place and practiced dishes and did all sorts of things. And then away we we went again and it also allowed us to sort of um we were, had some staff that we had brought on board for um onslow and that was obviously delayed so you know it gave us the time just to um put them into that business and focus on turning that round and then um refocus later on in the year on actually opening onslow tell us a bit about the oyster in what's what sort of experience does it offer and is there a dish or two that you can tell us about that sort of exemplifies the experience there it's a coastal bistro, so you know um, we 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 serve fish and chips and fish burgers and um, you know beautiful ceviches, amazing seafood platters. Uh, there's there's oysters on the island which are Temetuku oysters, which are down the um, southern end of the island, uh, which are really sustainably farmed and and they uh, they grow all year. They're absolutely beautiful oysters. So you know it's the oyster in a, a huge focus is oysters. Um, we shuck you know, every single oyster to order, um, which most businesses I think probably wouldn't do. Um, it's a, it's a bit, it's a labor of love that, um, but it's, it is what it is, right? With the oyster and that they are perfection. So uh, that's what it always has to be. Again, it's got to be simplistic and just delicious. And, and, you know, a lot of it's about looking after the locals on the Island as well, are, are really important to us. Um, you know, we've, we've, I've always sort of, seen that in businesses when you're you know places like Queenstown or on Waiheke Island with their small populations um, you know you look after the locals and the rest will take care of itself so we sort of had that sort of mentality about the you know how we um, deliver on food and service and it's very very warm um, you know very interact very you, most people walk in the walk in the door and the kitchen's just on your right hand side with the oyster bar um, you know front and centre and most people walk in and 
hi, hi, you know, and the kitchen says hi, and then they find the maitre d' and find a table, and it's noisy and bustling, and, you know, it's it's great fun. I go over there, you know, I live in Auckland, and we take the ferry over there to go to work, and I, I it's one of those restaurants, you know, you, rest, re, the business de-romanticizes, um, you know, cooking. You know, you love to think of it as romantic and easy and you know, pleasurable and all that sort of thing, but it's just bloody hard work running restaurants, right? It's, that's all. It, it's not not straightforward at all. But I always walk into the oyster inn and just go, ah, oh, God, this feels good. You know, it just it's 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 bright white blues. Looks over, you know, um, Onaroa Bay. It's it's a nice place to be. You spent a long time working on Onslow and you eventually opened it in October. It's the first restaurant that you've started from scratch, a sole venture. Uh, tell us a bit about it and what it feels like to build something from scratch like that. Yeah, that's more, that's uh, that's my wife and I, you know, Helen and I uh, have been working on that project and wanted to do that for a long time. Uh, and, you know, in contrast to the Oyster Inn, it's 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 dark stained woods. It's uh, It looks over the city. It's, um, you know, it's very, very sophisticated and classic and sort of classy uh, and, but very warm as well. Um, we, you know, and, th- and that's, that is really digging back to, what do I what do I love um, and, and, and what do I love about my whole um, sort of culinary history and training and all that sort of thing I I I'd love to support I go back to England and and that uh, the classic nature of some of those restaurants and the Savoy Grill and places like that and that old school style of service with the silverware and the the glassware and the crystal and I I just love it um, you know that's very me um, I love sort of quite classic cookery uh, you know old school terrines and you know just straightforward dishes in, in terms of that you know we do beautiful roast duck and and you know um grapes sort of slow braised beef cheeks and very really, very really classic food but quite interesting we you know try to comfort people but you know um throw a few things in there that challenge them as well um and uh, you know service I, I sort of i've sort of found over the last few years um and this is probably a, a trend that service tends to get dumbed down, you know, um, whether that's a cost management thing or, a, um, you know, running restaurants these days and trying to st- – in Europe, you still get a very high-end style of service, but things get very relaxed, right? That's where restaurants are headed, less fine dining, more um, sort of r- relaxed and, and um, no tablecloths and everything's gone, and that's great, um, you know, uh, but – People still want to be pampered. People love um, to be pampered. They go out and, and you want someone to make you feel great and, and, and really look after you. That's what true hospitality is, right? Um, looking after everyone, uh, someone's every need. Uh, and that's we, we, we put a lot of effort and emphasis into the service there to try and make sure we go over and above um, for every guest that walks in the door. Does Onzo feel different given the energy that you've put into it and that it's so different to the other venues that you've worked in before? Yeah, totally. It feels really different. And, and you know, sometimes you don't know why that, you know, you you, you pour your energy in, in, into places. And people will treat the um, – you're not always in control of how people treat your restaurant. You know, they they will, you know, you'll build something and you'll think it's going to be like this and people will come in and treat it completely different and you have to react to that. But a, a lot of, so many people have walked in the door and said, oh my God, I, we, we, and this is quite, quite, pertinent right now and relevant right now because they walk in the door and say oh my god I, I could be in new york i could be in london i could be it does this doesn't feel new zealand you know this feels this feels quite international um and i'm the, the yeah it's 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 sophisticated it's classy it, it definitely doesn't feel you know we're not we're not um we've got some beautiful new zealand artwork in there with that's very relevant to the building um but it's 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 about something that is really sophisticated and classy and it, and and you know not trying to play on the um what new zealand looks like you're uh, currently in a, a lockdown again at the moment what's it been like for you the last year and a half has has it changed you uh, I don't think it's changed me. I um I don't find it easy. I I said on a call today when I was Helen and I were talking to 
um, some people on a call um, and I said, well, uh, you know, we've actually had a really good four weeks in terms of business. We've, we've completely, um, we're, we're bringing in a whole new reporting system to our business um, and we're bringing a whole new sort of way of management, um, managing people and managing style and in and, and, and terms of um, how you present figures to them and all that sort of thing. So we're completely changing that, which is a massive job. Uh, and we're also rebuilding all our back end documents so that we you know when we when we open back up we we um we come out much better than we we went into this lockdown but I still feel like I'm floundering and you know i I don't feel like I've achieved much and i you know I'm frustrated and you know i i I can't fo- it's not easy to focus let's be honest sitting at home when you when that's not what we do we run restaurants we don't sit at home and you know, it's just not what we do. When you can open up again, which isn't too far away, um, what what's some of the positives that you'll take out of this experience, and and what are you expecting from the hospitality industry moving forward? Yeah, I think uh, it's been very resilient actually, and people are hugely supportive. You know, I had one of my mates call me the other day and goes, "Right, so what can we? You know, what can my business?" He's he's a lawyer. He's like, well. How, can I bring in 20 people when we get back up? Can you do me a cocktail um, sort of masterclass? Can we get in there in the afternoon? Because I know that's an area where it's not so busy. And we'll get 20 people in. We'll have a big, big lunch. Um, and then, you know, and you know they, they understand. And he did, funnily enough, he did that with exactly the same last year. He brought in um, 20, 20 people for lunch and they were still there at 7 o'clock at night. So, um, you know, you, you people understand how hard, uh, how much, much we're hurting, you know, and how difficult it is for us to be our businesses to be closed. Uh, you know, people bounce back really. Uh, our our customers give us amazing support. Um, you know, we thankfully have got, uh, I've, you know, I've got a good name in New Zealand, and 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 we have a great. Um, a great customer base, but you know there'll be a lot of businesses that are are really battling through, um, and it's and it's hard. So they do need they do need to come out and support their local businesses and come out and and eat and not be scared of getting out of the house. Um, otherwise, it's it's very difficult for us to bounce back. But you can see by how people behave that they you know they need social interaction and restaurants are the are the, are the fabric of that you know that 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 where people come to socialize and look at look and see and eat and you know laugh and dance and god knows what else you know that's so so it's you know you can see that they 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 miss that beyond covid when we move forward from this what are you most looking forward to oh i've got um uh, I think, well, firstly, imp- implementing all this new stuff that we're doing, that's really exciting for us because I think it's its going to be a massive change for our business in terms of reporting and all that sort of thing. So I'm really, I'm really excited about summer. Um, if I, I'm slightly worried that we'll fall into a lockdown over the summer period, which would, which would kill us, you know, it would, it would really be tough on everyone and in in the hospitality industry across New Zealand, you know, it's, you lose, you lose a September and a, I don't know, you can live with that. You lose December, January, um, February, and that's a whole different kettle of fish, you know, there's, it's, especially if you're a seasonal business. Um, so, you know, I'm just enjoying getting back into it, and it does refocus you. These lockdowns, you know, you you sit at home and you think and you appreciate everything that you've got, and and want to get back out there and really get your teeth into it. And yeah, that's that'll be the focus. Well, Josh, it's been an absolute honour to have you on Deep in the Weeds today to hear just some of your story. Um, good luck with everything. Please keep in touch, and uh, we'll catch up again soon. Thanks, Hux. Great chat, mate. I really appreciate it. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.